Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Biochemistry SI Program YouTube channel. Today, I will be covering how to find an isoelectric point. First and foremost, these calculations require that you know your amino acids. You must know their structure, function, side groups, and charge. If you don't know them, it might make this a little harder, so I'd suggest practicing them regularly. I suggest that you watch our YouTube video on amino acids that was posted two weeks ago. Moving on, first thing you want to do is look at the chain but also consider redrawing the amino acids individually so you can recognize the pKa's to the charges. I will quickly draw alanine and glutamate so you can see what I'm talking about. To form any peptide bond, an amino acid will connect from the N-terminus to the C-terminus until the chain completes. But you really want to think back to general chemistry and ask yourself what the generalized pKa of the individual terminus would be. Remember, the pKa of a substance is the pH at which half of it is in its acidic form and half of it is in its basic form. Therefore, when the pH of a solution equals the pKa of a substance, the substance is at its most stable state, making it intuitive that the pKa usually corresponds with pH. Given this, you can draw that the pKa of the functional groups of alanine first would match with the 2.34 on the acidic carboxylic acid group, and the 9.8 would correspond with the basic NH3N. So, what I do here is draw an arrow and write which one corresponds with which, but you don't want to break the law. Yep, there are rules and laws that regulate peptide bond formation. If an N or C terminus is forming a peptide bond, it cannot be used in your final calculation of isoelectric point. Ever. And, for the record, if you're wondering why this is even a law, it's because these amino acids form a peptide bond, they become so stable that they don't even require an isoelectric point to begin with. So that's why we count them out of the equation here. So let's apply it to our problem here. The carboxylic acid subgroup on alanine will not be included. Why? Because it is forming the peptide bond with glutamate. Moving on, let's discuss the relationship of glutamate and its corresponding pKa's. As you can see, there are three, and the most basic one will correspond with NH3, which also cancels out due to the bonding pattern with the peptide bond. But now you might wonder how to distinguish the two carboxylic acid pKa's. Well, you should remember that usually if an amino acid R group side chain contains a carboxylic acid group, the higher of the bunch will usually get priority for the higher number, which is usually written as pKa3. So, draw the arrows and assign them. So, glycine, again. Remember how intuitively, since it only has two pKa's, they both must cancel out. Why? Because they will both participate with bonding of the side chain groups. So, the last one. The question is, does this carboxylic acid participate in bonding? Yes, but not peptide bonding. So we can finally count this carboxylic acid in our final calculation. Again, remember our rule. The highest pKa, usually pKa3, is reserved for the amino acid R group, which would rule out our 8.95 immediately. Lastly, our 10.53 gets counted since it doesn't participate in bonding. Hey, it's editor Isabel here. Um, I forgot to cross out this lysine, so make sure you cross it out, because there should only be four left. All right, gotcha. Now, we have our four final pKa's for the calculation. So now, we have our four final pKa's for calculation. But let's stop here for a second. If you're confused on how I got here, please rewind and watch the video again. Maybe don't take notes if you did the first time, and pay attention to how I got there, because it is critical to understand to get an exam question right. If you've got it, move on to part two of the video, which will be posted shortly. Until then, I'll see you in part two.